and uh, now officially welcome with the recording uh, started. So first of all, I'll say a couple of words about myself. I'll give, I'll briefly introduce the panelists. I'll give them an opportunity to, to say a couple of words about the work that they're doing. And then we're going to jump into a conversation about how regeneration and carbon removal and, and climate solutions um, could play together. Um, so uh, it's really nice to have you here, everybody. I'm Martin, and um, I am, uh, I'll just, yeah, so I'm, I'm a father, and uh, I'm a husband, and uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. I love uh, I love working on new ideas and, and creating something out of nothing. And, um, and also, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I just, I really love life. Um, I really love life on this planet, and I really love people. And uh, that's why uh, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm hosting this panel today. I'm really committed to making happy homes. Uh, that's one of the one of the things that I spend a lot of my time on. And for me, that means that we all, as human beings and all life, are living on on planet Earth, happy and at home with nobody and nothing left behind. Um, so that's that's where I'm coming from. That that's why I'm here today. Uh, we got uh, three panelists with us here today. So we got uh, Bill Reed, who's tuning in from uh, Boston. I'll briefly introduce you, Bill, and, and the others, and then I'll pass the ball over to you. Just say a couple of words about um, your work. So uh, Bill, he's here um, in, in the very, very short version in his role or in, 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 in how I think of him as a regeneration master. Um, and perhaps student, I think that's something that we all are uh, in the space of regeneration. We're uh, always kind of students of it. Um, so really, thank you for for being here, Bill. You, you're busy, and uh, and I uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, thank you, Mark. We got Alan. He's tuning. Correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but I think you're you're in Portugal, right? Yes, waiting from Portugal. Tuning in from Portugal. Okay, very good. Uh, Alan, he's here. He's like. He is a super connector, but not not only with people, but also with ideas, uh, different concepts, uh, and, and all the knowledge out there. Um, and he's operating a lot, thinking a lot about um, the world and how we interact with the world as human beings. And, and, and climate is a big part of that. So uh, I'm really excited that you accepted the invitation and you're here with us today, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thrilled to be here. All right, and then the last panelist we got is Ir Ir Irina Fedorenko, and um, I just want to acknowledge before we introduce you, Irina, that um, Irina was one uh, was a panelist I had in the back pocket. We got a, a cancellation today, uh, back pocket not for today, but actually for a future panel. Um, but uh, we got a cancellation from um, Marcus, who was supposed to be here. He got sick, so we got Irina with us today, and I'm just really thrilled that you're here, Irina. Thank you for making the time on such short notice. And um, Irina, you're really here as as like an operator, as as like somebody who takes matters in their own hands, like as a, as a as a PhD and and and, and climate scientist or environmental scientist from Oxford. Um, you you like oh academia too slow. Let's do something about this. Climate tech entrepreneur founded a couple of companies. One one of uh, where you invented or part of the team that invented the first tree planting drone, and I know you're very active right now with Blender in the um, um, in the carbon space, uh, carbon removal with nature based solutions. So I'm really thrilled to have you here. So really thank you for making this time, Irina. Thanks for having me. Great. Okay, so um, Bill, uh, let's start. Let's start with you. Like I just want to give you and and the rest of the panelists um, um, a moment to. Uh, maybe maybe we can say let's try to let's try to limit it i want to make sure we also get some time for the discussion but if you can just say a couple of words about the work that you're doing and uh we'll go to alan after and then uh arena in the end and let's see if we can finish this in like seven minutes so not not okay. much time i know but uh please go ahead <laughs> rapid fire i hope rapid so fire. i'm an i'm a i'm a recovering architect and planner and who spent most of my life in the environmental space. I'm one of the early passive solar uh, designers from the 1970s. That's how long I've been in this. And uh, one of the co-founders of the LEED Green Building Rating System. And that's early stuff. And also for the last uh, 25 years, we've been working on uh, regeneration. And what does it mean to practice regeneration and through a company called Regenesis? And our tagline is, and this is where I'll end, is we partner people with their places to heal ecosystems and the human spirit. 
So I will end there. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Bill. Alan, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so beautiful, Bill. Um, yeah, Alan Laubsch here. And um, my uh, background really is uh, in risk management. I started out in Wall Street um, and uh, I've now moved into what I call planetary risk management, right? Where we need to um, mitigate uh, and manage the, the risks that are the most important, uh, the risks to our home, really. So these are primarily ecological risks that I'm concerned about. Um, I started with a kind of a foundation of looking at the economy and realizing that, uh, you know, we have the, these externalities, um, you know, that uh, uh, include polluting the air, the water, and our ground that are not capturing the models. So the very foundation of our models is wrong. Uh, one of um, one of my um, uh, one of my uh, I guess gurus uh, back at Stanford was Paul Ehrlich, and when I spoke to him about uh, you know the the state of the affairs of the economy, he 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 told me that he asks every economist. Hmm. Is Earth part of your models? And they usually, you know, kind of give him a quizzical look, and uh, and he goes, "Well, maybe it's time to rethink those models. So it's really time to rethink those models because if we're optimizing for something um, like profit, and it doesn't include externalities, and that includes your planet, um, we're in big trouble." So the realization really was that uh, you know. Anyone who's going through an educational system, you know, for example, getting an MBA, uh, you're really becoming a master um, uh, at extraction. Um, that is the uh, the mode of operations here. Uh, pretty much, um, you know, uh, working on Wall Street, I was like at the Death Star, right? That's anyone in any corporation, right? We're we're trained to be Death Star administrators with a higher educational degree. How do I extract more, faster, uh, and so on? Um, and it really is taking um, a major, major shift in culture for us to actually recognize that the, the very metrics that we're going by, that our North Star um, uh, really needs to be uh, anchored somewhere else. Um, I've been quite inspired by traditional indigenous cultures, which have figured out a North Star that works. Uh, I simplified as Earth positive, right? Let's uh, leave Earth better um, for our children. Let's think seven generations ahead. Let's be careful about the footprints we leave and have handprints that are bigger than our footprints, right? And, and with that as the North Star, um, I believe that uh, we can do an extraordinary amount of good in the planet. Um, we have incredible expertise uh, in terms of innovation technologies. The, the, the problems that we need to solve actually um, you know, these are not engineering solutions that we need. Um, you know, we're going to apply lots of them, but they're there. Um, you know, all the solutions are there. Uh, it's really, a, it's really a matter of coordinating, uh, coordinating that, and uh, and figuring out an accounting system that actually works. So, uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks for organizing, Martin, and uh, look forward to uh, Irina's intro. Thank you, Alan. Over to you, Irina. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, it's a really pleasure to contribute to this panel. I think uh, from my side, uh, it's always a debate whether uh, nature-based or technology-based solutions will be the uh, ultimate silver bullet to solving climate change, which I think is a false uh, assumption to start with. And um, in my career, I've been working in NGOs, I've been working in forestry, in ocean health, and uh, then I thought I'll become an academic. I finished my PhD at Oxford, and then I thought, actually, I can't just wait for five years, you know, to publish an article, and then someone may be reading it. So um, with uh, friends, we found that um, what is now called Dendra system, used to be called Biocarbon Engineering, uh, the first uh, tree plant and drone company, uh, which really approached uh, land restoration and uh, environmental restoration from a very uh, engineering perspective and from a very tech-based perspective, but then at the same time, I use technology to restore environment. Uh, and currently I'm a co-founder at Vlinder, uh, which works on blue carbon and is squarely focused on nature-based solutions and specifically on mangroves and also ocean health. And uh, it's always this weird mix um, 
between um, very engineering driven, very technology driven solutions uh, to very basic uh, solutions such as, you know, soil and uh, trees and uh, ecosystems. And so I'm mostly interested in how we can uh, blend them together and how we can act in harmony. Great. Thank you, Irina. Thank you for being here. And and uh, thanks to all the panelists, really. Uh, and also, re I think we may be forgetting the most important people here, which is the participants, or I don't I don't know what to call people who participate in panels and, and are here, but really like all of you, Frederick, John, Shiji, Daniel, Valentina, Michael, Oscar, Rohit, and Gabriella, and all the other people who will be listening to this. Really, thank you for participating in this conversation that take that, you know, that says huge about who you are, what you're spending your time on. So really, thank you for being here. Make this your own. Engage. We're going to have, oh, John, he sends like a little shaka shaka. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, we're gonna have some time for participant questions. I also noted some down that was uh, asked before the panel. Um, but yeah, let's, let's kick this off. We have three main uh, subjects today. Um, but I actually want to start out ex extraordinarily for this panel uh, with a with a bit of a with, with a very holistic question, which is, um, what is climate change? And um, and I'd love to I, I I unless anybody of the panelists like waves to me like this, then I'm gonna pick one to answer this first question. I would actually love to ask you, Bill, this question. What is climate change? Well, my reaction to that term, you know, that is a, um, a Republican from the United States, a right wing terminology uh, that's meant to kind of downplay what global warming is about. So cli the climate always changes, right? So of course, there's nothing to worry about. So in a way, it's a, uh, it's a term that obfuscates the real issue. Uh, and yet it's accurate which is what all good, good lies do. Um, so I'm a little, I'm, I'm sensitive to the term climate change because I think it just, it, it, it takes away from the import uh, and urgency that we, we face. Um, but what is climate change? Uh, climate change or, or is Or what result. is uh, global warming? Well, what is, okay, what is global warming? Well, global warming is a result of, um, increased carbon and methane and uh, other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that trap uh, trap heat. And it's a result of um, extracting sunlight from the earth, basically. And um, it's done, anyway, I, I won't get it. it. That's what it is, but that actually, um, and maybe this will tee up in a discussion amongst all of us is, that's like you said earlier, Martin, it's the symptom of some very poor um, and lack of systemic thinking. And uh, the opportunity now and the hard part about this is how do we actually create a world that actually understands relationships and cause and effect and, and how and then how we work on it. All right, I'll, I'm babbling now, I'll stop. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very good kind of uh, kickstart into this uh, conversation that we're already starting to ask ourselves questions about, oh, what are we even asking questions about? Like, what what is my question even about, about what climate change is? Um, so yeah, and, and maybe to add just a moment to what you're saying, uh, we're, we're cooking the planet, it's getting warmer and warmer. Okay, cool. That seems like an issue. Let's let's deal with that. The first the first subject that I wanted to propose that we talk about here, it, with regards to that, is look at some of the solutions. And typically, or in in some some ways, you can split them into engineered and nature based solutions. So um, with that, I have the first question, which uh, I'd love to ask you, Ellen. Um, what is engineered solutions uh, versus um, nature based solutions? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab of that at that. And I, I would imagine um, with engineered, you mean human engineered uh, types of solutions, um, you know, and, uh, you know, there um, we have uh, obviously all of the human uh, inventiveness that has allowed us to, you know, develop mechanically engineered solutions, electrically engineered solutions. 
uh, you know, uh, computer science uh, solutions. We have, um, you know, uh, we've engineered um, uh, economic solutions uh, as well. Um, and um, the, the, the distinction, of course, with nature-based is that uh, nature-based, um, you know, is something which, uh, you know, has its root um, in the way that uh, ecosystems work, uh, in the way that life works. Um, and um, nature-based solutions include things like everything from, you know, permaculture to uh, syntropic forestry, regenerative agriculture, um, so these are uh, systems in which uh, human beings uh, have been working together uh, with nature uh, to enable a thriving, resilient uh, system uh, based on symbiosis um, and uh, typically um, with a, a, a way of optimizing the output, not based on one single dimension. Um, where uh, we're looking more at uh, you know the the overall thriving of an entire ecosystem, um, the biodiversity, the resilience that we have, um, and not just uh, measuring something by you know uh, profitability of a particular crop. Um, but uh, you know there there are extraordinary nature-based uh, solutions that are much more effective than um, engineered solutions. For example, in water technology. Where we keep on, you know, building these massive water purification plants, uh, when you know so many studies have shown that uh, designing a wetland is so much more cost effective, um, you know, without negative externalities. But we love these engineered solutions because, you know, when you have hundreds of millions of dollars of budget to spend on big cement blocks and everyone makes a bit of it, you know. So um, if we're really looking at uh, how effective nature is um, at uh, water remediation, carbon drawdown, you know, soil uh, regeneration, um, you know, nothing that humans have ever engineered comes close to uh, what, uh, what nature already does when we, you know, set the right environment for, for, do for doing that. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Ellen. I think that's a very good, and I, and I, and I love the kind of the, um, kind of the maybe maybe tension here that there may be because of course this is a panel in partnership with uh, Zooglers which is the ex-Google uh, community as well as also some some here are Googlers I know uh, still working at Google and uh, of course it's a very engineering based company um, so I, I love we're kind of like coming in and challenging this so um, I have a question um, uh, for I'm gonna throw this one over to you Rina do we need engineered solutions and why? <laughs> um, yes, uh, yes, we do. Uh, and uh, I think we need all the solutions. And I think, again, it's um, it's a very false narrative to think that there is any one solution. And I know we really want to look up to the big guy with the big spaceship, you know, we may know who I'm referring to, to come and just crack it all and solve it all. And uh, I just don't think it works this way. And uh, no sustainable system can be uh, built or based on kind of one big solution or one big idea, one big individual. Uh, I think as a nature, uh, and actually, I, I really admire the engineers who work on the uh, biomimicry space to engineer the processes that nature actually came up with. And someone told me that we had uh, 10 billion years of R&D. Uh, and um, that is also something that needs to be acknowledged and uh, taken on board. And so with that, I yes, definitely engineering solutions are needed as much as all other solutions uh, to come together and to act together to uh, preserve what we got, um, uh, remove uh, CO2 that we have already emitted, and also look way beyond climate change, right? Look at uh, biodiversity conservation, look at other gases. Actually, methane is also a huge um, issue that needs uh, also to be soft and uh, a lot of methane removal also needs to happen as well. Um, so those are um, the, maybe some idealistic uh, arguments, but uh, I, I do believe that um, by working together, we 
we can um, come together as well uh, as people and uh, for uh, for the good of the planet. Uh, and in terms of areas of application, uh, since my work is in ecosystem restoration, uh, a lot uh, can be used um, to speed up ecosystem restoration, tree planting, uh, any machinery for uh, soil enrichment. Uh, of course, there is a lot uh, that can be done with um, regenerative agriculture and farming, and there are really cool uh, machines that can make this more scalable and more speedy. Uh, but then there is also a huge, huge lack of data. And when and data is a whole separate subject, so there can a lot can be done in uh, in the area of uh, carbon accounting, biodiversity accounting, looking for seeds, uh, which is also a huge problem these days. Uh, looking for places to restore and measuring restoration outcomes. So. You, this symbiosis uh, definitely needs to happen, and it cannot happen soon enough. Bill, I see you took yourself off mute. I'd love yeah. to hear your take on that. So I agree with everything Arena has said. And the question that emerges is, how do you do that? How do you get people to work together to um, or the what I how I frame the question in my mind as Arena was speaking is um, there's what we aren't working on are the processes to engage. Um, multiple arenas of solution in coherency with each other. Right now, we're, we're, we have fragmented silos all over the place. And uh, through whether ego or funding issues, um, the, the nature of the independent human going it alone and being the hero, all of these um, uh, cultural uh biases and pressures actually stand in the way of achieving all we have all the technology we need to solve climate change right now we had it 2000 years ago we don't need any new technology although i'm happy for the two tech i mean arena technology that's great i love it um the more the merrier and yet um do we depend on um on serendipity for this to work right now. That's what that's the way we're working, right? It's just whoever kind of gets there first. And maybe maybe there's a coalescing of of of, of, of synergies of, of of effectiveness. But I think that we are way behind uh, the curve in terms of social processes to link humans in much more effective and powerful relationships. And even how to think about that, and I, I that's where I would want to spend uh, this time conversing with all of you to find out what's going on out there. We have our perspectives, but and again, that's when the ego gets in the way. What 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 are the resources we can draw upon to really be effective in uh, the work? I hope that made a little sense. Yeah, lo love that uh, comment, Bell. And this is uh, you know this is the crux of it, right? Like you said. You know, solutions have been there for thousands of years. Um, you know, we've improved on lots of them, have some new ones, but, you know, we, we could solve it. Um, you know, if you look at what we have allocated towards planetary protection regeneration, you know, we spend more trying to battle a virus over a couple of years than we have ever on, you know, protecting the planet and the entire history of uh, humanity. Um, which would address the virus right <laughs> exactly so it's an allocation thing right so the, the 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 rough math that i've been you know telling people about is that uh we can you know if we if we start to allocate about one percent of our wealth uh, or one percent of economic activity into planetary regeneration that actually pushes us from being a net extractive to a net, net regenerative species and that's an order of magnitude uh, more than we've ever spent on that, right? So I tell my, you know, I, I, I tell people, listen, you know, I need to explain to my kids that, uh, you know, what threatens our future is an accounting problem. Mm -hmm. We're not accounting for this stuff, right? And the basic stuff is we're not accounting for Earth, right? We're, we're, we don't have a value uh, on natural capital, right? 
Um, and this is, of course, a very, very tricky uh, subject, um, you know, fraught with a lot of debate. But the point is, if you don't value it, um, you're going to destroy it. You know, if you just say, oh, trees are priceless, someone goes, okay, great. <laughs> I'm just going to cut them all. <laughs> you know, I no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I'm going to interject here, Alan. Um, so this is the tragedy of the commons, is what you're speaking of, right? And... Um, you know, Eleanor Ostrom did some pretty powerful work on common re pool resource in, in the 90s and uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for that work. Uh, and basically proving that the tragedy of the commons, while accurate, is not necessarily uh, inevitable if we, if we work with place, place by place. So one of the premises that I think that we actually need to get out there is that uh, and she said this this happens automatically, uh, which is people will ultimately, in the face of pressures, will take care of their home, will take care of the place they live. And I wonder if we are actually distorting and limiting the effectiveness of our work by talking about saving the planet. You know, the planet is too big. It's too abstract. This is just kind of my pattern uh, speech, uh, a little bit of a, of a getting on, the, on my lecture circuit. But uh, the pattern, the, the planet is too big and too abstract. There's no CEO of the planet, but we can take care of our places. And I wonder if we heal the earth place by place, is, is that a way to work more effectively? And of course, it's not either or, but how do we effectively work in place and, and launch that um, caring that is much more accessible and meaningful to people than something abstract like carbon in the atmosphere. Yeah, I'll throw that out for a discussion. Yeah, I'll, I'll just respond to that that briefly. And I, you know, I, I'm, you know, um, I think it absolutely makes sense to to act local, and we're seeing lots and lots of that happening. Um, and in fact, if we didn't have these clumsy nation-based uh, states uh, to try to do things, um, we would actually, you know, start to solve problems. Um, but if we keep on uh, using these uh, nation-based uh, artificial borders to kind of figure things out, if that becomes the driver, uh, then the local action you're talking about will never happen. For example, there is at least one nation that will benefit tremendously from increased levels of climate change. A lot of their frozen tundra will be agriculture will be uh, used to, useful for agriculture. Shipping lanes are going up, uh, go, going to go up. Uh, the uh, global chaos caused by climate change will, um, you know, uh, increase. Uh, will will, you know, be uh, be actually um, a relative and absolute driver. Uh, for increased demand from commodities that they will produce and grow, right? So not everyone's in the same boat, <laughs> right? If you're on a piece of frozen land that suddenly becomes a major thoroughfare for fresh shipping and the world production of food center, you're like, okay, let the rest fry. <laughs> we're gonna, we're we're happy to pump more of the shit out in the in the sky. So unfortunately, there is, uh, you know, a planet that is very, very that is at a tipping point right now where one single actor like that can tip the planet into into something you know uh, paul ehrlich was telling me that he's done he's looked at simulations where a small nuclear war let's say you know india shooting a couple nukes over at pakistan you know is enough to tip the planet into climate chaos cause massive crop failure so we're in this kind of butterfly you know effect uh, kind of tipping point where uh, we just don't have time uh, to rely on you know this you know purely local action we, we we need to have a governance structure that that transcends nations um and that has some teeth to it and we need to have a coordination mechanism that goes beyond saying well it's the right thing to do right where you know what um we want something where that's actually the 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 rewarding thing to do right right but uh, if you want to be a billionaire you know you don't just get there by pumping a billion barrels of oil out, but you get there by planting a billion trees, restoring a billion square meters of uh, you know, uh, coral reef, et cetera, like that, right? So to me, what we need is actually the coordination system that you're talking about um, is actually a new accounting system, a new incentive system that incentivizes what wasn't part of the system before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I'm, sounds, wait a minute. sounds great. 
<laughs> that's and the and the question is, you know, right now we're waiting for something. I mean, obviously there's lots of people working in different arenas, but I'm sitting here thinking, well, where where is the right one or multiple? There's no right one, right? But where are the coalescence of uh, multiple right ones going to actually create synergy that um, that 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 begins to build a new field? Because that's what we're talking about is an energy field shift. And right now I'm sitting back and saying, well, where is it? What is our role and how do we actually, is there some kind of proactive way we can get there other than just doing what we all know ourselves to be uh, interested in and invested in? And, and Bill, when you say, what is the right one? What are you referring to when you say that? Well, whatever emerges is going to be the right one. And uh, I'm not sure. That's the problem, is we don't have a right one. What Alan said makes sense. What Arena says makes sense. I'm sure all of you on the call right. here have perspectives that make sense. Yeah. And I, I have perspectives that make a lot of sense. We know work, what we do works. And yet we're very limited resource. Um, how, where's the critical mass? Where's, where's the where's the initiative that catches fire? And we're kind of waiting for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this 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 conversation right here, everyone is. I mean, I you know we I I promised you we're going to talk about three things, everyone. We're going to talk about nature-based solutions versus engineered solutions. We're going to talk about categories of nature-based solutions. And we're going to talk about the limitations of verification methodologies. Now, um, I just want to ask everyone, who wants to just let this conversation go wild or let, like, let, let it take, let, us, let, it, let, let the conversa conversation take us where it takes us? And who wants to kind of like steer back and... Um, talk about those three things okay so can i just get a you know raise your your virtual hand or your or your physical one like this if you want us to uh stay on track with the agenda okay who wants to stay on track with the agenda okay gabriella want to stay on track john want to stay on track cj want to stay on track okay good three martina want to stay on track okay thank you martina <laughs> Okay, who want to just, okay, four people, who want to just let this conversation go completely off the rails? Let's just let it take us where it takes us. Let's just go on this journey together. Frederick, he sends like a little thumbs up. Daniel does as well. Whoa, this is so exciting. Who else? Okay, it's a two versus four. Okay, so let the democracy speak then. We're going to try to steer. I'm going to, I guess that's my job then. I'm going to try to steer back to the uh, to the agenda here okay <laughs> wow uh, that's uh, hard i'm i'm split okay but anyways let's do it okay so go for it martin so i'm 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 cutting this one a little bit short but i did there's definitely a lot more to talk about here so um okay so the second point that we said we wanted to talk about today was the categories of nature based solutions um so we, we started talking a little bit about this here, um, and, and maybe we don't have to dive into specific solutions, um, but we could kind of fly over them and, and, and talk a little bit about them. Maybe, Irina, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this question here. Um, like, what, what categories for nature-based solutions are you most excited about? Or, or, and I know before you said also, well, we're gonna not, not gonna need one. We're gonna need actually yeah. a portfolio. But like, can you can you talk a little bit about like, how do you see this portfolio looking like? And don't limit yourself either to nature based. I mean, you can also include a little bit of engineered or whatnot. Like, I'll I'll let you answer this question how you wanna answer it. Well, I think. Uh... It's a no-brainer for me. I'm definitely most excited about mangroves uh, because to me, mangrove is a miracle tree uh, and it's an ecosystem I was not aware about much. Like It's a quite a recent uh, passion of mine. And um, in 2018, I went to Myanmar to work on a project and I learned about mangroves and I saw how people lived in the mangrove communities and uh, it's it's just uh, honestly a life-changing experience and mind-blowing for me so that's why I do what I do this day um, 
and uh, mangroves are super versatile. They protect both life on land and life on sea. So you kind of have this shield uh, that's a living shield and it protects uh, the people and the animals and sustains biodiversity on land as well as providing breeding ground for fish, for coral, for uh, all the marine and aquatic life. And uh, they sequester a lot more carbon than any other tree species. Uh, I mean, a lot faster. Um, but I think for me, the, the biggest um, and the most striking sight was really to see the impact of um, mangrove deforestation and destruction uh, on the coastal communities. Um, in 2007, I think there was a cyclone on Argus in Myanmar. and Officially, it killed 100,000 people. Uh, unofficially, they say the number could be three times higher. And as you ride through the coast, you see just some bricks, some remainders of structures that were left uh, in the places that were completely wiped out. And then you see uh, next door, you see actual villages that are prospering and the difference between the two along the same shore is that those that survived they had mangroves preserved and those that got wiped out they didn't have any mangroves uh, in front of them because they were cut down and this is just such a striking striking uh, image which just tells you that you know climate change is not an abstract concept it's not just about the concentration of some uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, like it's here, there are people on the front line, living on the front line and being very, very vulnerable. Uh, and they were not the ones who created the problem. They were the ones that had contributed the least to uh, creation of this problem, but they are the ones that are facing it on a daily basis. And um, by uh, restoring mangroves in this case, uh, they are able to reclaim their power to build this protective shield uh, to also create additional businesses. Uh, honey that's produced in mangroves is uh, very valuable. You can do sustainable shrimp farming, you can do crab farming, oysters grow in the mangrove roots. So uh, they are able to build a sustainable economy while at the same time protecting themselves. So that's obviously my uh, number one <laughs> uh, in my chart. Uh, of course, I'm also very excited about the potential for regenerative agriculture. This is also something that um, can affect all of us. Uh, we all eat. And uh, I think that um, that's another big solution that we can think about because uh, agriculture contributes like it's a major contributor to climate change, whereas it has a potential to be a sink. It has a potential to actually contribute to the solution. So far, it's only contributing to the problem. And uh, by enriching the soil, by getting rid of um, toxic uh, pesticides uh, and by intercropping or maybe combining crops with uh, tree species, uh, we can grow more organic food, uh, we can grow safer food, but we can also start sequestering carbon in the soil, how it uh, sort of should be done. So this is also an enormous potential and a great solution and the solution that can be also very local. Because when I talk about some mangroves in some distant country uh, that most people haven't been to, it's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to really understand unless you're really personally connected to it. Whereas food, it's something that we're all connected to and uh, pretty much any country uh, can have uh, sustainable uh, agricultural production. So, and on any scale really. So that is something that uh, I think could be brought home and to almost everyone's backyard. Mm. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah so I think those really two. great. I, I love what you're saying here. And like, like this thing about mangroves being like, uh, like the tree that sits on the border between land and ocean and, uh, and, and helps all coastal communities protect it and, and, and be a provider for those communities. And I'm also hearing it's not really only about the mangroves, it's about the ecosystems around and what and the impact that has on the environment. I see your hand, finger, Bill. I actually want to ask you a question, but I just want to like fr- spend a moment just to kind of frame it up a little bit. And, and maybe you're going to take it elsewhere. Let's see. Um, and, uh, and also, so, so I suppose that's one of the things, like given that we are land creatures, and uh, most of the planet is covered by ocean and um, and uh, the border between land and ocean, that's where mangroves live. And we tend to settle around near water, near water sources, fresh or, or, or salt water sources. Um, is there something, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is there something special around mangroves? And then also an, an, another question maybe to kind of take that to a level of, of, of like, system maybe like you were mentioning uh, um, a regenerative agriculture arena which is also one of the things that we as human beings have a very strong relationship to given we're eating all all of us so so if we were to look at those two like the two of them is something that's very we're touching a lot as human beings uh and it impacts a lot of our uh i suppose our um our communities. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and, and question, my question for you, Bill, is like, is there something special around these two? Like maybe that it's, it's two nature-based solutions that we touch a lot as, as human beings, um, or is there, is there other uh, ones we've forgotten? And then I acknowledge you put your finger up also. So you probably even have another thought that may take this a little bit in another direction. So that's three good, good ones. <laughs> hmm. Well, Every place is different, I think it's important to understand, and that humans have a role. This is what I wanted to address, and I think it addresses your, maybe all of your questions, is that we, uh, one of the issues that we face a lot in our work is we have the conservation movement and ethos, which is basically at the extreme is humans do not deserve to live on the planet. Human, the planet will be better off without humans, which kind of misses the point about why we're talking about all this. But... Um, but that's a very firm and very um, strong voice. The, the flip side of this, and if we talk about indigenous peoples and what it means to become indigenous again of the land, of place, in its most abstract uh, framing, is that we are all indigenous to the places we live. And how do we become indigenous again is, is the question. And that means that we need to pay attention to what life wants to do in that place. So it's not about saying mangroves are most important or regenerative farming is most important. They're all important, but what is this place? What's the highest expression of diversity that can be manifest in the places we live? And that means that we need to look forward or maybe into the past to see the patterns. The, sub- the equatorial regions of the planet were quite heavily forested 2000 years ago. And it's only because of mismanagement Maybe not, I won't say that's that's a stretch, but generally it's because of this because of mismanagement of the ecosystem and not understanding human role that we've actually created the deserts of the planet. So can we recover them? Yes, we can in many places, not all of them, but much more so. And so the question so the question I think is what is the human role to be to partner? and co-create and co-evolve um, the systems that we're part of. That's the fundamental question. And uh, that means that we need to understand that we are not a parasite, that we can actually reconcile and harmonize human life with, with natural systems. There are hundreds of papers now written on indigenous peoples about how the ecosystem is actually healthier because of humans, not in the absence of humans. And that means that we need to actually understand the role that we can play. And um, I just had one other point to make, but it slipped my mind. I'll stop there. Just let it go. Thank you, Bill. Alan, I I see you're over there. You're like kind of like uh, nodding, like engaging a bit here. Is there uh, anything that you see missing from what Bill is saying? Anything you want to add or comment on? Here, as we're talking, a li- we're talking a little bit about the engineered solutions 
uh, no, sorry, the nature-based solutions, a different category of nature-based solutions. Yeah, first, just uh, wanted to just acknowledge the the, the beautiful macro view uh, of uh, how we can all become indigenous. Um, it's uh, it's really quite an extraordinary thing that uh, we are empowered to do, and I think it's what Pill is really talking about is remembering who we really are, right? That that our purpose on life um, is not to be an extraction machine. <laughs> but rather to be a protector and nourisher of life, right? That's the, the highest function. Uh, and that's, that's simply remembering uh, and, and rerouting uh, to this planet, reconnecting to the larger nature that we are a part of, right? Um, so this is kind of um, coming back to nature, uh, reconnecting to nature. And I think that's fundamental. Um, we're not gonna have any engineering solution do anything if we still have the same extractive mindset uh, that is there, right? So I, I, I really wanna acknowledge that. Um, yeah, in terms of the engineered solutions, uh, you know, Irina mentioned some very, very good ones, of course, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, regenerative agriculture, of course, what's super exciting is regenerative agroforestry. Uh, I mentioned syntropic forestry. Uh, look it up, Aaron Scutch. He took the most degraded land in one of the uh, one of the states of Brazil, and is now the most biodiverse uh, rainforest in the entire state, um, while producing cacao and coffee at three times the rate and super high quality, um, organic, regenerative, without any external inputs. Um, so, uh, human beings uh, working with nature. Uh, can can have an extraordinary impact. Um, and there's a whole technique around that that I find super, super exciting. Um, you know, to engineered solutions, for example, there's some interesting hybrids. Uh, the port uh, in Ibiza right now, uh, I've met a company that's trying to uh, basically win a bid uh, to build the new, uh, the new port there. And they need a million extra euros, uh, you know, 11 million instead of 10 million to pour the cement for that cement to start to basically harbor marine life, be able to you know, uh, be a medium where oysters uh, and other shellfish can grow um, so that the cement can sequester carbon while building you know, uh, greater resilience, right? So this is a perfect example of human ingenuity working with human engineered solutions with these principles, biomimicry as uh, Irina was alluding to, uh, that are creating uh, amazing things, right? Uh, we're seeing municipalities like New York, uh, Boston invest in wetlands, right? New York with their, uh, you know, bringing back uh, the, uh, the the oysters that protected the shorelines and Boston recognizing that with more floods, we're gonna have to build uh, wetland buffer zones that can survive uh, extreme uh, storms and so on. Um, we're seeing amazing things happen in urban environments where, for example, if uh, you know, we have a three degree increase, uh, increase in temperature uh, in an urban area, that might mean 10 to 15 Celsius. And the, most, uh, the poorest areas in cities are the most exposed. They have least trees uh, in, 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 in the streets. And we've seen with all this work around tiny forests that even a playground sized forest can be a biodiversity sanctuary and human sanctuary to great greater resilience for these weather extremes uh, that uh, that we're seeing. Um, so uh, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very inspired because these solutions that have been around for a long time, you know, are uh, are actually being implemented. And uh, there's another layer which I, I'd like to just uh, get to, which I think is super important. And that is the, the layer of verification uh, of the impact and the rewarding of the impact. Um, and maybe that's a way to reconnect to Bill's original question. What are we seeing that's sort of kind of super interesting uh, out there, right? Regen Network has built an ecological state blockchain. Uh, using Sentinel-2 data, they're verifying soil, soil carbon sequestration on an Australian silver pasture firm, pixel by pixel. Uh, not perfect, but getting better and better, being able to back test it. So as opposed to spending lots and lots of money flying scientists around, taking soil samples, taking them to labs, burning trees and things like that, we're relying on um, algorithms, learning algorithms to, to do this kind of work instantaneously without humans so that we can have an accounting system to verify the impact. And once we verify, oh, wow, 
now we can estimate the soil carbon growth, you know, uh, so, soil carbon levels here. We can estimate all kinds of other things, the, you know, the watershed around there, biodiversity indices, and so on and so forth. Um, then we have something to work with. And we, we, we've got the accounting system that starts to give us an ideas of, idea about the health uh, uh, of a natural system. And then, of course, we can reward that as well. Uh, hmm. So those yeah. are, yeah. Bill, I, I see I your, want, your hand, Bill, yeah. Just quickly, I just wanted to actually get to the punchline here. This is what I've forgotten to say before, um, is that what we're doing is, what's the evidence of a healthy ecosystem? And and this is a this is a statement, that, but it's in the form of a question, because I'd really like everybody on this call's perspective if I've got it wrong. But my perspective on this is what we're seeking is um, evolutionary diversity. In other words, uh, ecological diversity in order to allow complex, dynamic, um, stable, stabilized systems to work. Because the more diversity we have, the more stable ecological systems are. And so the, the punchline for all of this is multiple species, a diversity of species with diversity of relationships, because it's not just the amount of species, it's the relationships, the opportunity to be in relationship that allows for dynamic stability. That's the game that we are working towards. And that is rarely discussed. So I just wanted to put that on the table that that's the punchline. And then you know, I think that then carbon will be taken care of. And I'd like to talk about process a, late, a little later on if we have time, but thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Okay, so I want to I wanna actually take one of the questions that was submitted ahead of the panel here, because I think that fits quite well into this conversation. Uh, John, that's from you. So, uh, and after that, we can go over and we can talk about the last um, topic of the agenda, which is the verification, which is very, which perfect segue as we start to talk about that now. John, do you remember your question or would you like me to uh, ask it for you? I, I don't. I'd like to hear what my genius question was. <laughs> what my what my past self's question was okay so i'm gonna read it all of it up okay and uh and you just uh, unmute yourself and um you know feel free to kind of like steer it a little bit in if there's anything in particular you meant with that that fits into this conversation here so increasing biodiversity is a huge part of the solution to the climate problem i've seen concerns about how a lot of carbon sequestration projects become monoculture terra planting operations, which aren't actually sustainable or healthy for the local environment. How are you seeing carbon removal and, and sequestration approached in a way which promotes local biodiversity? Anything you want to add to kind of steer that in or frame that, John? The the only thing I, I wanted to add is, is um, something I just thought about um, from the conversation that just had, which is also bringing into the accounting, um, like incomplete carbon science, like where we find out that carbon isn't being added to the soil, it's just being brought up to the topsoil from further down, and then we accounted for it wrong. But all that whole sphere of, yeah, of, of carbon sequestration and how do you do it accurately and well to push towards biodiversity. Okay, I think that's a perfect segue into the next question, the next topic, which is um, limitations of verification methodologies or verification methodologies. So the question that John and, uh, and uh, asked here, anybody here who will want to put their hand up and, and talk to that, Irina, Bill, or Alan? Otherwise, I'm going to volunteer one of you. <laughs> I think you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, I can start. Maybe my colleagues can um, add. But I, I think... It, it's not wrong, right? So the the biggest criticism, I think, in current state of the art verification is that it just fall like it focuses on one value and only one value, which is the CO two content, and uh, everything else can be neglected. And I think that's the common perception. Factually, this is also correct. A lot of the leading registries, both in uh, compliance market, but also in voluntary carbon market. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, it's usually voluntary carbon market. Uh, the leading registries only really ask for carbon as the only metrics to be accounted for. 
And that's how we end up with a lot of harmful projects. That's how we end up with palm oil plantations and um, all the wrong species in wrong places, eucalyptus, you name it. Um, however, um, so 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 the so this is not maybe the best approach to methodology and carbon accounting. However, what the market is showing us is that these are the projects that are not being sold out. The good projects, and there are plenty, they are always sold out. So the good projects that look only at local species that share um, benefits with the local communities that involve people who plant, that use uh, modern monitoring techniques that also use drones and satellites uh, as a way to go above and beyond what is currently even required. And uh, if we talk about Vera, which is um, uh, the largest uh, database, basically the largest registry for voluntary carbon mar market projects, Vera even has the standards for CCB, which is a biodiversity standard, and SDVista, which is the social impact kind of uh, SDG standard to enable projects to also uh, certify through this tool in order to put layers on the top of carbon and make projects more high quality and ensure that it's not just about one value, but about people and biodiversity as well. And those are the projects that are actually really desirable and that are really valued. So um, it, it's true. And I think we are seeing actually less uh, bad projects. So if you look uh, in the market in general, uh, you can find, like you can find a lot of low quality projects, but these would mostly be from the past. This would be the projects that we've done in the last two decades uh, and when the market was not that sophisticated. So in this respect, I'm actually quite optimistic uh, because it's the private companies that drive it. It's the corporations that committed to net zero. Uh, it's companies that have the vision and also really go above and beyond uh, in terms of asking for quality. So even if the methodology itself doesn't require it, the final customer, the client would require a higher, higher level of accountability, higher level of biodiversity, social impact, all of that. So yeah, having said that, there's still plenty of cheap, low quality carbon available. And there are actors who just want to buy the cheapest carbon and say that they're not zero so they, don't get me wrong it's the, it, it exists but um uh, i'm quite optimistic about uh the level of scrutiny which is really hard when you are a developer uh, to face this but uh for the market i think it's great and um that also moves the market significantly thank you Irina. Okay, so Bill, Bill and Alan, like, what are you? I, I know Alan, you've you probably spent a lot of time thinking about this. So maybe I'm, I'm going to ask ask you a question about like, how do you see like, what is it that we need to get right to like take what we got that Arena's already pointing at the trends that oh, we are actually getting better at this. Some like some uh, certifications and status it is emerging. It's starting to become the more desired. Uh, types of projects that that uh, companies want to invest in and support. Um, is there anything missing in in in, in our approach in, in how we are doing our accounting and 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 yeah, what what do you see in the future for us here, Alan? Sure. Um, so what we essentially need is uh, we need to have um, impact verification that is science based, data driven, and doesn't you know rely on the. 1980s bureaucracy framework by which all the existing standards are built. There are gold standard and so on and so forth. It's always the same thing. You fill in the application and put in this this thing and this thing and this other thing. It's it's you know we we've reached a different era where now the planet is covered with uh, monitoring devices. Um, you know on the ground above 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 ground where we can have. A very, very accurate view and a continually improving view 
um, of a full range of metrics uh, around ecosystems health, right? So that that's kind of a foundation that we need. We need a, a super brain, right? To, to just use all this stuff that we built for whatever military purposes, commercial purposes, but it's there, it's free, right? We can use this information for nature. Um, and, uh, you know, basically have this super brain uh, around uh, what we call the process of monitoring, evaluation, and rewarding um, uh, the uh, uh, regenerative activities around the earth. Um, that was the, uh, the purpose for um, a community that we set up a few years ago called Earth Pulse, monitor, evaluate, reward, super brain to reward protectors of Mother Earth, right? Um, the, uh, the, the, the backbone to all of that um, has to be a digital marketplace powered by blockchain, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer powered, where whatever token of carbon sequestration, biodiversity, and so on and so forth, you can see what's the origin, what's the contract behind it, uh, does it give me confidence uh, in something without having to, you know, uh, email some registry about some information uh, that uh, you then look up, right? So we really need an entire digital ecosystem around uh, uh, the the monitoring, evaluation, uh, as well as the rewarding for that impact. And then all the other stuff uh, basically falls into place. But that's the global accounting system, super brain that I mentioned. Mm. Thank you, Ellen. And and Bill, like coming from the from the from the well of regeneration, and I know you. I mean, you work with the the lead um, building rating system. Like, what what's your what's your perspective on this? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting. I rarely use lead anymore. Um, the uh, although I, it's a good checklist if you're interested in certain arenas. Uh, I think the what comes up for me in this is. We there's multiple metrics that I'd love to talk about the metric systems we've developed too. I don't think that that's important one way or the other. What's really important is that there's a, conti a continuity of engagement in each community, each place that is evolving with the with the feedback, if you will, that comes from those metric systems. Um, we're when we're talking about living systems, which is what we're talking about with regeneration. We're talking about how do we stay in the game of evolution? And um, to do that requires us to reawaken, to rebirth, to regenerate our understanding of the system of life in the places we live to adjust, to adapt. Right? We, life continually changes and we need to learn to adapt to that and also propose what might need to be in place and then find out did that work or that didn't work which requires a sustained practice of engagement over forever let's just say forever because that's really what's required that's what sustainability requires so while we might have all sorts of different metrics and baselines and indicator systems um that's great What's the repository? Who receives that and what do they do with it? And that's a cultural shift again of, do we meet every year? What's the purpose of New Year's, for instance? Maybe New Year's, instead of just getting drunk, is to actually assess, how did we do this year? And how might we, um, what might we need to do this year to go forward? That's an enriched purpose of New Year's. And I think people would find that meaningful. Uh, when well they do I, I can tell you they do find it meaningful we need a lot more people to find it meaningful and uh, so that's my that's my yeah <laughs> I love that <laughs> yeah let's uh, let's ask it but let, let's create what we're doing in the following year rather than getting drunk on, on New Year's <laughs> and uh, yeah I think that there this is a great uh, subject um, so everybody I, I just want to acknowledge time okay so here in my time zone okay, we're I want to pick what did David say? Are they, are they mutually exclusive? No, of course not. <laughs> yeah, good one, David. Um, so that was the first, uh, the first audience question, and we got an answer to that already. Very good. So we know what we're do what we're doing for next New Year's, everybody. Okay. So uh, with the last eight minutes remaining, I would like to invite everyone to engage here. Like you know, all those burning questions that you've noted down that you wanted to ask throughout this panel here, like. At, now is the now is the moment to ask them. So feel feel free to unmute yourself, ask the question, or you can stick your little virtual hand up, or if you have a physical one, you can do that too.
Mm. I would like to ask a question. My name is Martina and I left uh, Google seven years ago. I was in Ireland at the same time as Martin. And uh, I left Google to go traveling, which I did. I, by now I've been to 133 countries and I've seen how beautiful the world can be, but also how vulnerable it is and how important it is that it's get, there is getting more and more awareness on this topic. And my question is, is in two ways. Um, and maybe good to mention that right now I work for a charity which is called War Child and we help children in war zones, which is very important to do. Um, but I am planning to make a career move more to yeah, making the world a bit greener. So I'm wondering what we can do as individuals, but also I find it a bit of a daze finding my way to what the options are in this uh, in this world, yeah, in, in, in this field. Maybe you guys have some tips on this. And uh, Martin, thank you so much for organizing. It's been very interesting. Thank you. That's my pleasure. That's my pleasure. Okay, so who who wanna who wanna answer the question? What can we do as individuals? Bill, I'll try. I'll try one. Uh, and uh, this is um, uh, I speak from uh, my my lack of performance in this area. So it's a gap in my life, Martina, and that is that. Um, we need to spend more time in our communities and um, engaging. I travel all around the world, and so I I feel I feel a little guilty about that because I should be working in my home place uh, or at least someplace nearby. So the one thing that we can do as community members is to develop community and purpose in our community, work on that potential. So be an advocate for this kind of thinking in the places we live. So that's my quick answer. Thank you, Bill. All right. Okay. So, and thank you for the question, Martina. Okay. And thank you for being here. Frederick, I saw you uh, unmuted thank yourself. Do you have a question? Yeah. I mean, look, we, I think Europe is just a global problem, right? And Europe is just, I think we are the best at the world. Yeah. But I think the um, biggest, let's say, polluters are in, uh, in Asia. Right, and I think uh, climate change won't stop if uh, China and India won't change. So um, I think that's uh, the question is on the, and maybe that's um, a regulatory question or it's a policy question. But I think what needs to happen are to drive uh, stop climate change on the big scale, right? Because um, I think we can do our best. We can recycle. We can fly less. But it's just. I think it's just a fraction of what we can make in order to stop climate change, which is good, right? And um, But I think greater things need to happen in order to make a significant shift. Maybe it's a statement or a question, I don't know. Yeah. So, but, you know. I, got, I got the question, like what, do, like, what do we need to really move the needle on a, on a global scale uh, with China and, and, yeah. and India and other countries being big polluters. Irina, you unmuted yourself. Do you want to have a stab at that yeah, one? Yeah, that's a, a big question. And of course, China and India are huge polluters, but also if you look at uh, CO2 pollution per capita, that will be actually very small. And the largest uh, carbon footprint per capita is actually in the United States. And the reason why China and India are so... Um, heavy is because in other rich countries outsource their pollution to them, right? Because they made China and India the workshops of the world to produce dirty, cheap goods that we consume here. And therefore we don't count this pollution as in our country's budgets. So um, so it's, it's very complex um, issue in um, climate politics in general. Of course, we have one global mechanism, which is the UNFCCC convention, right? So the uh, COPs that are now uh, gaining kind of more and more fame. Um, but I mean, the, the, this, this is the one convention that uh, regulates uh, pollution kind of quotas and, and rights uh, uh, between all the countries in the world, pretty much. Um, and it's not perfect. And it's um, it gets a lot of criticism because I guess people expect that it will just solve everything instantly. Uh, but still, this is one process to follow if you really want to learn more about it and if you want to get involved and there are ways to lobby 
in there and obviously again there are ways to put pressure on richer countries to um to provide more technological assistance for example to countries that are not yet there um but for example china is the largest investment in renewable uh, energy uh india can also leapfrog and a lot of places in india are leapfrogging off the grid anyway so you know you, you go from not having an electricity to having complete solar electricity so you don't even go from the process to getting like coal based uh grid and then only go into solar you just go from nothing to solar so that there are things like that that are happening in these countries but uh just the the volumes and the number of people and yeah um so yeah but anyway so uh follow the unfccc negotiations if you want to <laughs> stay tuned to that thank you irina and look so so we're now one minute uh, until the half hour mark here so i just want to take the last minute i know there was a question from cynthia and cynthia you also submitted a question before thank you so much for that i think that's that's really makes a difference i, I really want to thank all of the uh all of the the audience here for being here and all the audience that will be listening to this recording uh being a part of this conversation is something that makes a difference both for, for yourself and also as you go out and you spread and you share what you're learning and what you're discovering with with your people in your life so i would encourage all of you to do that and lastly i just want to say thank you for for being here bill alan and and irina really like i know you all very busy people i've had so much fun john is clapping over there <laughs> on mute thank you so much for making this time and and sharing it with all of us sharing your expertise and knowledge um it is uh yeah it's a privilege to have you here so thank you thank you martin thank you all all right thank you all everybody and uh yeah, I'll, I'll share the recording with everyone afterwards. So you have that. And um, yeah, see you on the next one. Have a fantastic Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.